It is Wednesday, my dudes, which means it is time for another first thoughts and initial impressions video. This one will be on Teyu. As always, we're going to be going over whether or not I think they're good, where I think they're going to be used. We'll talk about things like stat ranges and possible equipment sets that they could be uh, used on for the most part. Uh, before we jump into the S3, if you're not already, please consider leaving me a like or a subscribe. Helps out here a ton. And with that out of the way, let's jump right into his S3 introduction. Your fate had been settled the moment you stopped me. Your interruption will grant you eternal sleep. If I was going to feel guilty, I wouldn't have even began. Taking a look at Teyu stats, he is an Ice Warrior of the Virgo Zodiac symbol. Why is this character ice? We literally just watched him use a bunch of fire attacks. Why is he ice? My best guess is probably would have something to do with the S3, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. The Virgo Zodiac symbol is shared by Judge Kise as well as Mui. Taking a closer look at the stats themselves, he has 1,039 attack, which is abysmal for a five-star warrior. 5,340 health isn't much better. It's pretty low for a five-star warrior. 115 speed is pretty good, but it's not fast enough to be an opener, especially when Conqueror Elias, Ran, and Para exist. 617 defense is solid for a warrior. 27% critical hit chance is very good for a starting crit hit chance. Critical hit damage is obviously standard at 150. Dual attack chance is still 5%. Starting effectiveness of 18% is nice and no effect resistance. Imprint release is health for the team, which is nice. Imprint concentration leaves a lot to be desired at 18% attack. That's really bad when you consider how low this guy's attack is. You're like getting 180 flat attack on this character for having him at triple S. So yeah, attack is really poor. You're most likely not really going to get him much higher than 3000 if you really go for it. Um, and then his speed, if you sacrifice everything for it and put him on a speed set with like 20 speed, uh, per piece average, we're looking at roughly the high 280s, which is, again, not enough to take turn one from some of these faster characters. Let us move now on to the skills, the first of which is his S2, which is a passive Azure Waves of the Open Ocean. After an enemy uses a non-attack skill, dispels all debuffs from the caster and becomes enraged for three turns and grants skill nullifier once to the caster. Can only be activated once every three to four turns, depending on Malagora. So this gives the Enrage buff, which show of hands, how many of you remember what the Enrage buff does? I wouldn't blame you if you forgot, because only three characters actually have it in the game. And the ones you're probably most familiar with are Mort as well as Clarissa. It gives you 10% speed and 10% damage as a buff. Um, not damage, I'm sorry, attack. So yeah, again, low attack stat, 10% attack, not really a lot. 10% speed in this case is like getting an extra like 11 to 12 speed. So essentially when you proc this skill, when they're using non-attack skill, you're going to get roughly around 100 extra attack and you're going to get about 11 to 12 speed. That's what it's doing and you're getting the skill nullifier. This is their attempt, I guess, to make a blue version of Politus or Selene. But unlike Politus and Selene, this move has no combat readiness push which means that Teyu is relying on his base speed in order to do the job that his you know, peers in the same space actually are doing. And now I know what you're thinking. They put it on the artifact. And we'll talk about the artifact at the end, but you know, it, I don't think it's enough. We'll talk more about it. We'll revisit it with the artifact section. So yeah, this is supposed to be, again, a passive that is in the same vein of Politus and Selene. Okay, and then we move on to his S3 here, Tornado Sweep. It has a four to five turn cooldown depending on Malagora, and you acquire three souls upon usage. Attacks all enemies, dispelling two buffs, and increases the skill cooldowns of the target with the highest attack by one turn twice. That is a single target, by the way. It is an AoE attack, but only one target gets their cooldowns reset. Increases the attack of the caster for two turns. When the caster is enraged, dispelling buffs effect changes into dispelling all buffs. So you will get some form of strip regardless of whether or not you have enrage or not. So you're not completely useless in using this move if your opponent decides to play around it like they commonly do with Politus and Selene. So you will get some value there. 
But I can't help but think that this character being changed to ice or being ice and potentially being like being fire and then potentially changed to ice. Sorry for the wording. Yeah, um, it has something to do with this move because this right here, this skill cooldowns of the target with the highest attack are being uh, increased twice by one turn. That is like tailor made. Like we made this specifically for Hua Yong, and now it's on a blue unit. So I have to assume that Hua Young is probably exceeding their expectations in terms of statistics of usage of win rate of things like that. So yeah, Tornado Sweep feels tailor made to basically come in turn one and wreck Hua Young. You get rid of two buffs, which she has two at the start barrier and immunity most likely, right? And then you will reset her S3 so that she's much more manageable. So I guess this is their attempt to put another one on the pile. We already have Kisei. We already have Red Hand Guy. We have Judge Kisei. Judge Kisei actually is the most similar, I feel like, to Teyu because she's a character that's in, like, the 270 speed bracket where she is just coming in to... Her only value is essentially strip the immunity off at the start and reset the cooldowns of Hua Young or whatever character Hand Guy and just try to win the game from there in that short window where your opponent doesn't really have access to their full skill set. That's kind of where I feel like Teyu is going to end up being seeing Tornado Sweep. The character is most likely going to live or die based on how effective he is at countering Hua Yong in this meta or whatever other character there might be that you need him for. My biggest problem is how does he get to turn one um, when there are other openers that can just lock him down? He's not entirely like... Uh, like Politus or like Celine, where they have like the huge combat readiness push. And I'm going to keep coming back to that until we get to the artifact. He also, again, has that increased attack, which cool. He's going to do more damage after this one. But again, he has a 1039 base attack. So attack buff doesn't really go that long of a way on him compared to somebody with like 1200 attack, for example, or like even 13. Those characters are just going to do way more damage than him. Uh, I do like, though, again, this clause about how if uh, he's in uh, in rage, he'll get the uh, dispel all buff. So it gives him more value later on, but he still has the value of at least stripping at the start uh, the necessary minimum amount of buffs in order to make sure that he does the job. Um, I think that Judge Kisei and Blue Kisei are still better options to counter Hua Yong. And I think that Celine and I think uh, Politus are better options so far at this point with uh, countering non-attack skills. So let's move on to his final skill, which is his S1, Full Moon Slash. Attacks the enemy with a spear and increases combat range of the caster by 15%. That's really good, right? We always talk about that on the channel. Getting a combat range push of 15% is very good on an S1. Uh, you know, Hua Yong has it. Landy has it. Hand Guy has it. DN has it. These are all very good characters. That is a good thing to have on your S1. Damage dealt increases proportional to the caster's speed. So now we're getting somewhere where this character might actually want to be built really, really, really fast. When the caster is enraged, activates Tidal Crash as an extra attack. Tidal Crash can only be activated once per turn and only during the caster's turn. Tidal Crash is an extra attack. It attacks the enemy by slashing downwards with a spear. Damage increases proportional to caster's speed. We need to see the multipliers on this one because in the video they show you, the Tidal Crash follow-up does like 13 or 14k damage and just like destroys an Apocalypse Ravi. So this move might actually be like really powerful and this might be the value of the character where you have this S2 uh, to punish non-attack skills and then it's like, all right, cool. Um, even though I don't have the combat readiness push, now if I actually get my turn, I can just delete you with full moon slash. I can just delete a character. So maybe that is the intention of where this is going to be at. And... I have a lot of reservations on the character, but until we see the multipliers for this move specifically, I will reserve my judgment because on paper, I don't think he makes the cut. I think he is just like fourth in line at countering the thing that he wants to be countering in this current metagame. But if Full Moon Slash is like as ridiculous as it looks in the video, then yeah, maybe this character will actually be up there with Blue Kisei as like top choice for countering Hua Yong when still needing a blue damage dealer on the team. The Soul Burn effect here, by the way, increases the damage dealt by Full Moon Slash. Again, need to see the multipliers. But again, from what we saw in the footage, the S1 looks like it's just overtuned as all hell. 
And now to wrap it up with the artifact, it is Spear of Purification. It increases the attack of the wielder by 10 to 20% based on the artifact level. And then it has, after an enemy uses a non-attack skill, increases the combat range of the caster by 10%, can only be activated once per turn. Okay, so this character, again, I keep harping on this low attack, but like at this point, you're really just overcompensating for giving him a stat line that he probably should not have had. So he's got a low attack stat. We gave him in Rage, which is 10% attack. We're going to give him an Artifact that's 20% attack. And then we're going to give him an Attack buff for 50% more attack. To so try to compensate for the fact that this character just has crazy, crazy, crazy low attack. So I'm not really a big fan of this increases attack. I would rather it have been damage, especially since we know that S1 plus the follow-up are speed scaling moves. So attack is not really, um, it's just really not the best choice here. And the other thing I have to harp on here is it increases the combat range of the caster by 10%. And it doesn't get any better based on artifact level. That is so low. And this is what I keep talking about in the S2 section. Politus is 30% combat readiness on her S2 as a base. And her S3 is, inc or, I'm sorry, her S2, the AoE attack can be incredibly debilitating if it's on Abyssal Crown. You will get things like... Uh, potentially an AoE stun, or if it's a damage politics, you might get a cleave and win the game. So it's very punishing for your opponent to take that risk on a non-attack skill because there's the, again, the strip, the AoE, the potential stun, and now it's probably Politus' turn, which means you're going to take even more damage. You're going to get unbuffable. You're going to get blind. You potentially risk getting another stun. So S2-ing or non a non-attack skill into Politus S2 has the potential to lose you the game entirely, right? Now look at Celine. Celine has 20% combat readiness base. And then with her artifact, she gets an extra 24. So she gets 44%, which means that if you use a non-attack skill, even a really dart slow Celine is probably taking turn two almost assuredly. And the crackback on her S2 blink is probably going to kill the best character on your team, assuming it's not like Hua Yang. In which case, that's a 50-50 because if they high roll and, uh, and just go 50-50 and hit her, then it's going to be her turn. And then the S3, even on a miss, is probably killing. So if they high roll, it's still like a game over for you. So for both of those non-attack sk uh, skill characters that are meant to punish them, they put you in a situation where a non-attack skill is probably a game loss if you actually use it. Now we look at Teyu, right? Teyu has an AoE dispel on his kit as well as a cooldown reset on his kit. So unless this move does a ton of damage, it's not really like, that's not going to kill you, right? He's getting a skill nullifier and a small attack buff if you trigger his non-attack skill passive. So the alternative is he could soul burn like say S1 uh, and this go for the double tap. Maybe that kills, that's why we need to see the damage on it. But you see how like on paper, Teyu doesn't feel as punishing as his other peers that are in the same space. And then with 10% combat readiness, it pigeonholes you into that like 270, 280 speed Teyu build that we talked about earlier in the stats section. Like you're gonna have to be on speed set and have that level of speed in order for 10% combat readiness to matter. Cause if you're like 240, 250 speed on this character, right? And you they use a non-attack skill, that 10% is not gonna be enough to guarantee that he gets the second turn. He doesn't have any survivability in the kit. He has very poor HP, so he's probably just going to end up dying. Whereas compared to Selene, you can be very fast and threaten like a thunderclap off the start to kill somebody if they don't want to use a non-attack skill. Or you can build a very slow bulky one that just sits there and kind of lives. You can't really do that with Teyu. He's kind of feels like he's going to be pigeonholed into that like 270 speed range like I talked about. And then this gets worse if you're playing against Cleave because they like to first pick Politus, which cuts CR in half. Now you're only getting 5% CR on a character that doesn't get any survivability. And as far as we can tell without seeing the multipliers, doesn't have the game-winning impact of his peers. That is where I feel we are at with Teyu. On paper, he feels like the fourth best option to deal with Hua Young. I would rather play either version of Kisei or Red Hand Guy before I played Teyu. I could be wrong, obviously. On, you know, he could have insane multipliers on his S1 and his S3, in which case then he'll be right in the fold and he'll be right up there with Blue Kisei and things like that. So we're going to really need to see the numbers at the end of the day. But on paper, um, it feels like they went 
for a really safe uh, bet with this character rather than risking another potentially overpowered character. And honestly, like if there was one space where I wish they would have gone hard and made a character that was really strong, it was the blue character that would punish non-attack skills. That's the one spot where I think they should have gone very punishing because characters like Politus and Selene have very interesting gameplay to me. It really makes drafts interesting um, and it makes play patterns less one-dimensional. Um, and I feel like like seeing people like take gambles or like make decisions under those scenarios kind of brings out the skill a little bit more in the game. So I really wish they would have went overboard, but I guess Hua Young way overperformed, so they really had to like undershoot with um, with Arya, and then then they're gonna undershoot probably potentially with Taeyu as well. So yeah, those are my thoughts. If you disagree, uh, if you think I'm being way too harsh on this character, as always, let me know down in the comments below. And then as always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Later now.